will make a start. Um, it's a very great pleasure for me to uh, chair this LeCam lecture session at JSM uh, and to, in particular, to introduce Jianqin Fan. Uh, Jianqin is the is a professor of statistics and the Frederick L. Moore 18 professor of finance in the Do Department of Operations Research and Financial Engineering at Princeton University. Um, he is a very distinguished statistician, someone uh, I've known for very many years, and um, I'm sure we're going to hear a fantastic lecture today. Um, I would just say that the LeCam lecture is uh, it, the, the LeCam lecturer should be an individual whose contributions have been or promise to be fundamental to the development of mathematical statistics or probability. So an endowment was set up by friends of LeCam to cover the cost of travel. Well, that's not so relevant here. And a plaque for the lecturer. Um, so Jantin, uh, it's a very great pleasure to have you here and we're look very much looking forward to your talk. Okay, uh, great. Uh, thank you, Richard. So you could hear me, right? Yes, I, I can hear. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, it's really my <laughs> great honor uh, to uh, to give a Lacan lecture, uh, and uh, you know, thanks to the committee members who select me. I even do not know who for nominated me, but uh, well, uh, or at least I forgot. Uh, thank, thank, thank you. Uh, it's really honor, and the Lacan lecture is particularly, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, meaningful uh, to me. So first, I know Lacan for thirty five years. Uh, has been knowing him so he's really a gentleman and a great scholar. Uh, we all know that uh, he is probably one of the most famous uh, for mathematical statistics, at least for uh, abstract uh, asymptotic theory. So he invented many, uh, I mean, uh, concepts like uh, limit experiments, uh, deficiency, uh, distance between uh, two models, uh, local asymptote normality, uh, contiguity, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. So given the uh, the abstract, right, so of, uh, I mean, uh, Lacan's work, I was worried he might have only three students or five students. So I went to math genealogy and take a look. And uh, so math uh, genealogy lists uh, the foreign, uh, I mean, uh, seven famous, uh, uh, sorry, I mean, the, uh, I mean, it lists 40 students and uh, 598 uh, descents. It's a lot of students on average one per year. And then I went to Wikipedia. So Wikipedia has a very short article about Lucien Lacan. So, uh, well, uh, but uh, it's very sweet. Right? So he, I think, uh, uh, I think he went to Hyde in 1943, joined Rebel or something, and then he graduated in Paris in 1945, and uh, he well worked for a hydroelectric uh, company for five years and attending statistics seminar. Amazingly, without education, he he was invited to Berkeley to become a lecturer in statistics. And in 1950, that's in 1950, in 1951, he left his wife. And in 1952, magically, he got a PhD under Jersey Neyman. So I don't know how he got it in such a very uh, quick time period. And uh, yeah, and, 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 and then throughout his uh, I mean, career, he forced many famous students. So these are the students uh, that, I mean, most of them, I have my academic brother and sisters I know well. I mean, uh, I mean Julia Bloom, uh, Tom Ferguson, Steve uh, Stigler, Grace Young, Jianlin Wang, Bing Yu. Uh, yeah, so all these were listed, uh, listed there. And, uh, uh, and the Lacan is particularly uh, instrumental to me. Uh, so first of all, he brought me to Berkeley, no exaggeration. You could imagine 35 years ago, I had to go all physical to Beijing library, right? So in order to wait for hours to open, you know, a guide to application to the, to the outside world. And I, Berkeley is one of the places I applied. And uh, in, on the form, I put myself as a PhD candidate in Chinese Academy of, of Science. And uh, the graduate school basically said that I'm not qualified. The opportunity I could learn myself in China uh, because I'm a PhD candidate. The opportunity should give it to another person. So Lucien Lacan as a director of graduate studies for all the way for, for very long. So at the end, I got admitted and with the most sweet fellowship to Berkeley. 
And then the first semester, uh, I didn't study other courses. I directly studied his new books, right? I mean, with him on uh, foundation on asymptotic method in studies of decision theory. So it took me one year, even though he gave me both semester A pluses. I don't know how much I really know about it, but anyway, so he was very uh, instrumental. I want to study with him. Uh, and he said, well, I'm too old for you. Uh, someone like David Donahoe, uh, is young, energetic. You should work with the younger generation, which full of ideas and uh, advise me to work with Peter Biko too. Uh, so, and he supported me throughout my career. So he gave, uh, I mean, hotel lecture in uh, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. We have a uh, uh, very, very fond uh, memory and time with him. And this is the time actually Lucien and I actually knew. And interestingly, he was so kind he and I even smoke together very often in his office or in, and later on when it's banded, we, we, uh, we smoke together in the corridors. Okay, so I'm no longer smoking by the way, <laughs> but that was many years ago. So this is uh, my talk. My talk today is on under, understanding spectral uh, embedding. And this is the joint work uh, with Emmanuel Abbe, who was my former colleagues here, uh, and uh, Kai Zhen Wang, who was my uh, former student uh, here. So Kai Zhen now joined Columbia, Emmanuel Abbe uh, now with uh, EPFL. So I'll give, um, I mean, an introduction. Uh, I mean, why spectral embedding is important. Uh, and then I give a canonical example just to dilute the technical that involve uh, in understanding uh, spectral embedding. And we introduce uh, an LP theory uh, that necessary technical device for us to get in uh, uh, to prove the optimality of uh, of spectral embedding uh, to the fundamental limits. And then we uh, I think showcase by two applications to mixture models uh, and uh, application to contextual community detection. So the interest in this area I think grow from you know I mean our three independent interests, right? So for years, I have been working with economists on uh, factor modeling, factor learning. Emmanuel Abed was uh, doing community detection for many years. And Kai Zheng in general, just interest in uh, these uh, high dimensional phenomena of uh, PCA. So let me uh, begin with introduction uh, on PCA and its, uh, spectral embedding. So spectral methods certainly uh, are fundamental to study. So uh, machine learning is very fast to compute. It's based on math moments, uh, which should require relatively few assumption. And it has been widely used for dimension uh, reduction, like principal component analysis, factor analysis, multi-dimension uh, scaling, uh, manifold learning. And uh, it has been used in clustering, unsupervised learning that I'm going to focus today, uh, community detection and mixture model and contextual based uh, mixture these two uh, pieces of information uh, together. And then in uh, signal processing like uh, synchronization, uh, blind deconvolution, uh, and so on. Right? And the spectral method has been widely used in uh, like uh, many non-convex optimization as a good initialization. When, for example, major completion, uh, mixture models, phase retrieval, tensor uh, decomposition. So no doubt that there are huge uh, literature in applied mathematics. Uh, statistic, machine learning, uh, and economic uh, communities. So it's impossible uh, even today for me to mention, just to read the name of those contributors would take more than whole Lacan's uh, lectures. And this has been, has a very long history. And it's no doubt about it, right? So um, uh, the, to me, principal components analysis uh, in machine learning uh, play exactly the same role like regression in statistics. So you can easily uh, understand the spectral method appears all, all over the place. And here is one, I mean, uh, classical examples uh, of, um, I mean, they published uh, by November in 2008 uh, in Nature. So in which uh, they collect uh, nearly 1400 uh, individuals. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, SNPs, and they, uh, each individual contain uh, nearly 20,000 SNPs, right? So N is equal to this, dimensionality is, uh, is much bigger than M. And now if you just do, I mean, graphical, right? Two-dimensional embedding, that is you get in two principal components, uh, two directions and project the data on these two principal components uh, uh, directions. These are usually called PC scores. 
So it's not just doing simple scatter plots here. And this scatter plot, right? So uh, certainly form natural, uh, I mean, clustering. And these natural clustering uh, align very well with the geographical uh, clustering in Europe. So this uh, showing that spectral embedding does carry uh, some kind of, uh, I mean, migration geographical genetic information across time. Okay, so here's another completely different uh, application of spectral embedding that is the, in the community detection. So in this case is a simulated data because for simulated data, we know the ground truth. So uh, I simulate uh, 5,000 data points. This is the 5,000 members in the community. Half of them uh, is in one community, let's say Democrat. Uh, the other half of them is in another community, let's say called Republican for temporary purpose of talk. Right, so the within community uh, connection, the probability is Bernoulli trial, two person know each other with Bernoulli with probability like this, right? So because each individual person has N trials, right? So on average, you know 4.5 log and number of people. So still a lot of people, quite dense network, right? Uh, so this is the, uh, the probability within the, uh, within the community, uh, the connecting probability is this, otherwise independent uh, Bernoulli. And the between is smaller, uh, in this case is exactly 18 times smaller, right? So it's quite strong uh, signal so that I can show you uh, clearly the picture. So what you observe is adjacency matrix, right? So in other words, it's a realization of Bernoulli trial. So if two person is in the same community, the successful probability is this P. If two person is across community, the su successful probability is what we call Q here is, uh, is the uh, the, uh, the diagonal. <clears throat> so if we do a little bit uh, mathematics, right? So if I ask myself, what is the expected value of this matrix A, right? So is a Bernoulli trial, of course, either P or Q, right? So if I do this, uh, so this is a little bit of mathematics. So I'm trying to, so I have adjacency matrix, uh, which is a realization of Bernoulli uh, trials, right? Uh, and uh, so if I write down expected value of A, so if they are in the same community, right? So is two community index I call J and JC. In our case, would be the first uh, half and the second half, right? So this would be exact P, and uh, uh, and uh, for this community uh, is uh, also P within a community connection, and across community it would be uh, Q, right? So this is expected value. Uh, in our case, is M by M matrix of this. So if you calculate. What is this? So this is a rank two matrix uh, with the first eigenvector looks like this. It's very easy to verify. And the second eigenvector looks like this. And the first eigenvalue is this and the second eigenvalue is this. <clears throat> so, uh, so this is uh, the, uh, uh, so this is the, uh, I mean, the uh, probably I missed an N here, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so this is the, uh, uh, the uh, I mean the, the eigenvector. So if you look at the second eigenvector, right? So the second eigenvector, the elements is positive, reveal one community. The elements is negative, reveal another community. Right? So in other words, for this spectral simulated example, what is the ground truth? The ground truth is the second eigenvector. The sign of the second eigenvector uh, indicate one community, and the sign of uh, of the other. Uh, uh, I mean. Uh, uh, indicate another community. Right? So of course, in the reality, you and I do not know what is the true sign or what is the membership of each individual person in a network. Uh, so uh, what we know is about this A, so I could calculate the empirical eigenvalue rather than theoretical eigenvalue. Right? So this is the empirical eigenvalue, the second empirical eigenvalue I put down here. So the second empirical eigen, uh, uh, so eigenvector, the second empirical eigenvector I uh, draw down here. So if second empirical eigenvector, which has a, the signal plus noise here, uh, truly, uh, I mean, is uniformly, uh, I mean, uh, small, in other words, the empirical and theoretical are uniformly close, then I could using empirical one to perfectly classify uh, the uh, the two communities. So this is uh, a toy example in this community detection uh, without any uh, any normalization or uh, any centralization. This, it is the second eigenvector that uh, categorize 
the uh, I mean the membership of the community. So therefore, we use the uh, 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 use the the sign of that, right? So uh, despite is the method being widely used in practice, there are still huge gap in theory, right? So uh, so uh, so the natural people may, I mean, spectral method usually being used as initialization for maximum likelihood estimator or for uh, semi-definite programming. Uh, we naturally ask, uh, can simple algorithm, like a spectral algorithm, enjoy the same theoretical guarantee uh, as more sophisticated ones? So in other words, the guy is just good enough. It's not really the second class citizen, it's the first class citizen too, right? So this is part of the purpose of today's talk is to sh uh, show that the spectral method enjoy the same mathematical property as those uh, non-convex optimization problems. Uh, I mean, like MLE or I mean, or semi-definite uh, relaxation, much more complicated uh, computation. Now, uh, the, the second question we naturally ask, if I cannot estimate my principal component direction consistently, can still, uh, because dimension is so high, right? Can still uh, embed the spectral embedding uh, give me, a, I mean, a consistent faithful uh, uh, results. Right, so this is the second question, uh, the, let's say the right cost rate. Right? So in the situation that we have here, right? so we have sample size much smaller than dimensionality. I cannot expect my di direction to be consistently uh, estimated, but I was hoping the spectral embedding still give me the meaningful results. Right? So this is uh, the, the second question we are asking here. Uh, the third question we ask here, there's a lot of studies on the parameter, right? So principal component direction is a parameter covariance matrix. Uh, so, uh, so now uh, PC score uh, is uh, really a, a random variable in a sense, right? So can we, uh, I mean, categorize some properties on PC scores rather than principal component direction? And the, uh, lastly, I mean, in community detection, uh, most of us study independent Bernoulli entries, right? So they have, uh, they have uh, independent entries and the inspector embedding necessary is a Visha type of matrix, right? So it's a coherence matrix, they have dependence. Can we still talk about eigenvector or random matrices with uh, dependent entries? So these are the, the thing that we are going to talk today. So let me begin with a canonical example, the Gaussian mixture model, right? So let's imagine that I have NIID data from two population, 50% chance from uh, this normal population, right? Another 50% chance from the second normal population, right? So, uh, so my observed data can be, or I model it uh, as this, right? So each individual, I do not know whether it's positive sign or negative sign, right? So it's a true mean vector, times uh, a Radamach uh, random variable independent of this uh, noise ZI, right? So in other words, uh, each individual observation, the identity is positive or negative, uh, uh, I mean, direction, uh, sign uh, with, uh, with probability uh, uh, 50% uh, Radamach random variable. So this is the model. And our goal of course is to recover this YI, right? So individual membership, uh, whether it's a positive group or negative uh, group. So these all observation is in D dimensional uh, space, right? So if I put in this in the matrix form, the first row uh, indicate the first sample, the second row indicates second sample and, and, and so on, right? So easily we can see uh, I have this, right? So it's a rank one matrix. Right, so why what I want is this low rank uh, left singular uh, vector, right? Uh, rank one matrix plus a, a Gaussian noise, or, or in general could be uh, a, a Gaussian noise. Right? So this is our observed uh, uh, vector. So in this case, naturally you will get uh, uh, the sample coherence matrix of this X and then use the first principal components, right? And project the data in the first principal components. So now the question naturally you ask is how well can we recover our cluster with the unknown label Y right, by the first eigenvectors of X transpose X. Right? So this is by using the PC score. How well can we, uh, can we recover uh, this? So this is uh, the question that we are uh, asking today. And here is the methods, right? So first you compute X transpose X 
uh, and this is the graph matrix. And uh, now we just delete the diagonal. So we, I put an H here means hollowing. Right? So you just set diagonal to zero. So in other words, off diagonal elements is the inner products between Xi and Xj, right? And uh, the uh, the diagonal is uh, is zero. And why we are doing this? Right? So here, the main reason we are doing this is we are considering more general scenarios in which uh, I have heteroscedastic noise sigma i here, okay? I could have a uh, heteroscedastic noise coerce matrix sigma i here. Uh, so this is the later on we would be considered more general than this uh, spherical uh, situation uh, here. Uh, okay, so, uh, so, so now if I calculate the diagonal uh, elements, right? so if I include diagonal, so diagonal would be in a product between itself, consists of two parts, right? So, so the first part is a signal you want, and the, the second part is the heteroscedastic noise that you might uh, got here, right? So this is why we do horring. And uh, it's been known that horring really, uh, uh, I mean, I mean, improve the concentration and help, uh, I mean, uh, tackle it with heteroscedasticity as in this literature, including, I mean, uh, the, what's it called? The uh, heteroscedastic PCA by, I mean, uh, Kai and his collaborators. Okay. Uh, now, this is the theoretical, uh, right? I mean, the theoretical G, right? So, uh, so empirical G based on the grand matrix, and we just hollow, hollow in it, right? Uh, and uh, the population version would be this, right? So in other words, if we go back to here, the population version or the expected version we're hoping is we are learning about the, uh, I mean, the grand matrix of this matrix. So in this case is equal to Y, Y transpose. So we know that the Y bar, the Y we want uh, is from this uh, G, right? So uh, the eigenpair, let me call mu and lambda bar, uh, mu will be uh, exactly the, I mean, a rescale of Y you want. Y is indicator indicating the membership that you are unobservable to you. And lambda is the, uh, is the eigenvalue. Right? So this is the eigenpair uh, of this matrix, it's rank one, right? So our method, as I uh, said a moment ago, is very simple. You take this G, right? Uh, you got the first eigenvector and then take the sign. Right? So the first, uh, the method is very simple. You get the eigenvector of this G and then you take the sign, right? Uh, and this is your, uh, this is your cl classifier or clustering, uh, I mean, uh, algorithm. Uh, and uh, now the question we are asking today is how good this spectral method is, right? So in order to analyze this, so by definition, mu one, u one uh, is uh, is the first eigenvector, so it satisfies this condition. This is the definition, right? Suppose that I were able to show uh, this guy can be replaced by a theoretical counterpart, uh, mu by lambda bar. So if I replace this by by this pair, then I achieve a very nice linearization, right? So a highly nonlinear eigenvector depending on uh, this G uh, now become linearly depend on this G. So then I can do a downstream analysis. So part of our, uh, our contribution is to develop the tool to show how close these two guys is, right? So this is, uh, this is really the LP analysis that we are going to do uh, later. Now, uh, now, because now the the ith member of this right, so it is indicating which one uh, the ith thick observation, which cluster ith uh, observation coming from, uh, is become the sign of this right. So if approximation is close, so the ith member is looks like th is this right. So because this G is hollowing, so the ith member is not used right. So the ith data point is not used. So if you really write it down, it's very easy. I know it's in the talk, it's hard to pass, but G is defined this way. You can easily see is equal to uh, to this. It's very easy uh, to show. So in other words, is really if I ignore this uh, concept, it's really uh, the xi, the i theta point, project on your estimating of mu. Uh, mu is the, the, the population mean of the data. Right? So in our case, only positive or negative sign. So, uh, so in other words, what we are really doing here is uh, if this approximation is good, uh, so then the spectral method is really become a Fisher classifier. Imagine if this mu is known to you, this is exactly Fisher classifier. Right, 
uh, and, uh, this is uh, for this is uh, two case. If all label is known to you, uh, so this is uh, this is exact uh, exactly I data points, right? So this is exact Fisher classifier, and now because we're doing horin, so this is really the uh, the cross related estimation of Fisher classifier, and we using the Oracle knowledge of other. Uh, YJs, right? So YJ technically unobservable to you, but the, uh, but the, this is we are pretending that you're observable. So in other words, if I were able to show this guy is close, then the classifier that you use here based on uh, spectral methods is equivalent to uh, you are using the cross validated uh, Fisher classifier. Uh, from unsupervised learning to become a supervised learning, and you could easily imagine the spectral method would be uh, optimal in many uh, in many ways. So now here is a very simple example just to demonstrate uh, the the role of Hori. Right? So here I just do a little bit twist. So if my covariance matrix covariance matrix uh, is uh, is heteroscedastic, but only the first one being twice as big as the others. So because uh, uh, because of heteroscedastic issues, uh, even in like let's say we have I do simulation and you go to uh, one hundred, so it's one hundred uh, sample size in five hundred dimensional space. The signal strength is uniformly distributed. I mean sampled at uh, uh, five hundred dimensional with radii three. Right, so the first half is in one group and the next half of this one hundred. Uh, next fifty is in another group. So the true membership is what I'm showing you here. The first one is in one group. The next one is in another group. So if I just, without doing horroring because of this heteroscedastic issues, so the principal components is achieved at nearly unit vector in the first components. Right? So this is the one receive a lot of energy and the remaining receive very small, right? So if you use the sign of this red dots to classify, uh, well, the error would be very big, right? 48 nearly <laughs> next to uh, random guessing, right? Uh, and on the other hand, it do, it, if you get a horror matrix, which eliminate these heteroscedasticity in the diagonal, right? Uh, as we said before, so the, uh, you eliminate this, uh, this part, right? Uh, then, uh, well, then the classification error is only uh, 3%. Okay, so uh, so here is uh, a peak of our results, right? So for this uh, special uh, Gaussian mixture model, or so we basically before remember I asked a question: How close this approximation is in hand waving uh, form? Now I'm writing a little bit in more mathematical form. What is the difference between these two? Right? So the difference between these two u and the, is linearized Gaussian approximation, which replace sample uh, eigenvector and sample uh, and sample eigenpairs by population eigenpairs right so the lp norm of this uh, less than epsilon n and the lp norm of u uh, is controlled by this so we can show this so in this the the strength i mean the bigger the p is uh, the stronger the result here is, right? So here we basically say how you can control uh, the approximation error u to its linearized version here, depending on your signal to noise ratio. So the biggest one is signal to noise ratio uh, in signal to noise ratio defined by this is a signal to, uh, to noise ratio. So here we can see the larger signal to noise ratio, you're getting a larger uh, P it allows you to choose a larger P, so therefore you get a stronger uh, control, uh, control with a smaller probability. So in particular, so long as signal to noise ratio uh, defined this way for this uh, clustering problem, Gaussian mixture problem, uh, is big than C to log n, then this C to log n norm you could easily show the LP norm would be equal to L infinity norm. This is just elementary inequality. Uh, you could show uh, this equivalent. Then our result really basically saying that uh, if I just substitute in this guy right into P, basically saying the L infinity norm, the entry wise estimation uh, approximation error is uniformly controlled with high probability. So in this sense. 
uh, we recover a results that uh, Emmanuel Abbe and I, uh, I mean, wrote uh, a few years ago, published in uh, Annals of Statistics at uh, year 2000. So, so in other words, if your signal is long enough, big enough, big or equal to log n, you can have infinity. Uh, uh, I mean, getting uh, this uh, L infinity approximation, otherwise you only get LP approximation. Now the question is, uh, uh, so which one really given a tighter control for re in reality, right? So we said before uh, LP approximation, uh, and this is uh, smaller than this, right? So I can do just simulation and verify which one I should give a better approximation. So in this simulation, I take n equal to 1,000, d equal to 10,000, and signal to noise ratio changes from very small, right, uh, to very large, right? So very small uh, L infinity approximation, which is the ratio of L relative error, approximation error divided by L infinity, right? So this one is the red curve. But L, when signal to noise ratio is very small, we know that L infinity approximation is not good. You cannot control it. But nevertheless, right, the adaptive control, LP, P is dependent on signal to noise ratio, will approximate uh, very well. Right? So this basically verified that uh, the, I mean, the approximation error uh, is really depending on signal to noise ratio. Now, why LP approximation is enough for us to do, uh, I mean, the, um, uh, to do clustering, membership st uh, studies, right? And here is uh, one line of very uh, simple uh, mathematics. So, uh, so the approximation, right? So for the entry, the, the approximation errors, the, uh, the, uh, the proportion of approximation error big than uh, M uh, epsilon, right? So this is, uh, this is the proportion. We usually use L infinity, but as we say L infinity, control really require very strong to signal to noise ratio, right? So, uh, so if we use apply Markov inequality, uh, just like a moment's uh, inequality, you get to this, right? So this is Markov inequality. So now if I rewrite this, this is really the LP norm. Uh, and then for our special case, uh, U is basically just equal to uh, LP noise. And you can easily see uh, is equal to this. So, um, so if you have LP control, you 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 still have you still say that even though my signal is not strong enough, right? Uh, so I cannot expect to all entries uh, being less or equal to this, right? But I could say that the entries violate uh, that would be with a very small proportion, and this proportion is negligible in our uh, studies. So therefore, uh, so therefore, uh, the LP is uh, sufficient. So in other words, uh, there are few percentage of you who have a large deviation and this kind of exception probability is uh, very small. So, uh, so we getting into the conclusion, like when we have very strong uh, signal case, all of our, uh, all of our uh, control uh, is entry-wide control. And this would be like uh, uh, in our previous work. And this one, we extended to the, uh, to the LP that allow the, the control to be signal uh, ad adaptive, right? So we are now um, give you an idea what is the uh, LP theory. Uh, so now let me uh, give you, uh, uh, give you uh, a little bit uh, better look of uh, the LP uh, uh, theory for principal component analysis. Right? So, uh, so here we basically trying to show entry-wise approximation uh, with a leave one out, uh, I mean, idea. <clears throat> So here is a more general setup than the toy example we had. Uh, so we have um, uh, XI and whenever you see a bar on top of it is really means the, the fixed population center, right? So it's a, it's a usually, we usually, usually write mu I, now where I write as X bar, right? Uh, plus noise. So this is just a notation like mu I, okay? So I have observation in D dimensional, uh, uh, across the like, n sample, and I compute my gram matrix, right? And the uh, gram matrix, and I hollow it, so I only let diagonal to be zero to kill the to deal with heteroscedastic issue of this uh, zi, right? So, uh, and then the population version, I formulate the same way uh, instead of using uh, uh, the observed data 
you use the expected data. Right? So you use expected data to create that. Now I have two systems, right? So one is the empirical eigenpairs, all right? So I have eigenpair, uh, we, I have at most uh, like uh, n non-zero right, uh, eigenvalues. So, um, so this is the eigenpair based on Horold, uh, I mean, uh, grand matrix. And this is the eigenpair based on uh, the population version. Now my question is, what is the behavior of these individual uh, eigen uh, vectors, right? So uh, can we linearize this so that we can understand spectral embedding? So in order to describe this, many of us, including Richard, right, so I contribute to uh, a kind of David Kahn type of theorem. Uh, so less delta bar being the eigen gap, right? Uh, and X bar is your population version of, of expected version of observed data. And uh, we assume, uh, I mean, we assume that uh, the, there are some kind of incoherent conditions. This incoherence is slightly different from Emmanuel Kandes uh, use, but uh, let's nevertheless call uh, that the, the energy being spread all over the rows, right? Uh, and then this is the uh, sort of like a, uh, sort of, sort of like the condition number, right? So this eigen gap divided by this. So we assume these are of order one. Of course, in more general version, we allow those to diverge. Just condition getting a little bit too complicated to present, right? So we allow heteroscedasticity, but we require sub Gaussianity, right? So the uh, the uh, characteristic from a moment generating function right, uh, is bounded by this. So, so in other words, all each individual sigma i is bound by this sigma. Right? And then we require uh, noise to signal ratios, reasonably small. Uh, so this is the noise divided by signal, noise divided by signal, right? and then gamma had to be bigger than this uh, root n in order for uh, the horror in creating biases in order for the bias to be uh, negligible. And then we can show uh, as what we were promised, right? So the, uh, pop the sample case eigenvector and the population and has this linearized form, right? So this linearized form, recall by using definition, I just replaced this part, right? This part should be the sample version now I replace by population version, so it now become highly linear. Right now is a the whole thing is a linear combination of G, right? So linear combination of G, we know how to analyze that quadratic form, right? So this one bounded, uh, right? LP norm bounded with this small probability, and this P really depending on. Uh, noise to signal ratio or signal to noise ratio. Uh, the bigger the signal to noise ratio, the stronger control you have. Uh, so in particular, if the uh, the signal is big than signal to noise ratio, no, not the noise to signal ratio, is big than log n, as we said before, you have this kind of, uh, uh, I mean, L infinity controls, right? So long as you have your signal to noise ratio strong enough, you have, uh, you have uh, uniform control. So in other words, uh, if you have strong enough uh, signal, then this approximation error, which is the fundamental in our analysis, as I showed you before, right? So this part usually is much easier to analyze, uh, right? So remember we say class validated, uh, Fisher, this uh, classifiers was analyzed based on this approximation. Right? So you have uniform control over all entries. If you have weak uh, signal, then you have, you can control a majority of entries by using Markov inequality. Uh, and the, the results uh, has, uh, uh, can be further generalized to like uh, approximation of eigenspaces, right? So in this case, this is the eigenspace from S plus one to uh, S plus R, right? And this is the population counterparts, right? And then this is the population's, uh, I mean, eigenvalue in that, uh, that, uh, that range. And uh, we define L2 P norm means each row you calculate L2 norm and then uh, this form a, a vector uh, and then this vector you calculate LP norm is not in major induced norm. Then we can show a uh, similar, right? So the eigenspace that you are uh, concerned with, if you find best uh, orthogonal transform because there's a, a rotation ambiguity, right? Uh, it, you can be linearized like this. Uh, and this approximation error holds in, uh, right? If I have R rows, it's L2, 
uh, L2 and P, right? so L2, P long, I just introduced here. So you have this kind of uh, controls. Uh, and similarly, if you really uh, con uh, consider the M entry of this, uh, you also have this kind of like linearization uh, approximations. So, uh, so in other words, uh, the PC scores for the M entry, you have this kind of uh, linearization. Uh, so we could obtain similar result. When you do principal component PC score, you are really talking about normalized version of eigenvectors. You could have you get the very similar results, and because we are all talking about grand matrix, which is really the inner products, right? So the inner products concept could easily generalize to, uh, I mean, to Hilbert space, right? So uh, so therefore. Uh, we our results naturally just extend to, to hollowed uh, kernel PCA. So uh, so here I don't uh, present that, and uh, uh, the the sketch of proof is a lot of detail, uh, a lot of like uh, uh, elementary uh, inequality here and there. But this is uh, but I, let me just you know dive a little bit and hopefully that you can, can get an idea uh, how do we do approximation, right? So as we said, this is really the definition of eigenvalues, or eigenvectors, right? So if I take the nth entry, that is, means this nth row of this, right? Times u divided by this lambda over, so this would be like this. And lambda is a number usually uh, by value type of theorem, you usually could easily replace this by population version. Now, the only thing that we need to, to show is how can I right to achieve linearization? How can I control that term? That is, replace this term by its theoretical counterpart, right? So uh, the theoretical counterpart, let me denote by u bar, right? Then I uh, add in one term, I subtract one term, so I, that would be equal to that, right? So then the so now I achieve linearization. The question is, what is the linearization error that we need to bound, right? So in other words, if I rewrite this. So the uh, the approximation error, right? So is approximate equal to this. Now we need to bound this. Now the challenge of <clears throat> of this is G, right? Uh, <laughs> this is the row. I mean the mth row of grand matrix, and this eigenvector is highly dependent, right? So therefore you, uh, therefore I mean it's very, relatively hard to analyze, and this is uh, this is the challenge. But fortunately, uh, this, uh, uh, these two guys are dependents. Fortunately, we have uh, have like uh, uh, yeah, we can decouple them, right, and then uh, apply the uh, the concentration inequality. And this uh, get to like a leave one out uh, trick, similar to what we do in cross validation. You know, so leave one out. So I introduce right uh, an ancillary matrix which just delete original G. I just set the nth column, uh, nth row and nth column to zero, right? So this is GM. Uh, GM and G only differ in one row and one column. So it's pretty close, right? Uh, and then let UM to be its associated eigenvectors, right? Okay, so if I do that, then the quantity I want to analyze uh, this, right? Uh, that in other words, I want to bound in this error I can always inserting a term like um, right? And then, uh, uh, and then subtracting these terms, right? So now I have two terms. So this term is uh, quite beautiful. Uh, uh, this term is G and um indeed are, uh, I mean, are, in uh, are independent. So if you look at the structure of Gs, uh, once you delete that rows, uh, they are actually uh, doesn't have uh, common entries. So these are independent. So you can condition on this as if this is a, a, a constant then you can analyze this part. And now this part is because I only delete one row and one column. So you can apply sort of like cauchy schwarz or uh, David Kahn type of theorem to control this. Right? So this is uh, exactly what we do. So the nth column, because of horroring, and thanks to the horroring, uh, you really can be written into two parts. One is depend on the n entry, uh, nth observation, and the other doesn't depend on m entry uh, observation. So these two parts are independent. So now you can condition on, uh, let's say, on this part. Uh, you can analyze uh, the uh, applied concentration inequality to this inner product, and the remaining terms uh, is really a kind of Cauchy-Schwarz, uh, and then you apply David Kahn type of theorem to control 
uh, that, right? Because these two mu only differ by one row and one column. So this is really the, uh, the, the idea that has been widely used in dealing with uh, dependent entries, but the dependent is not that strong. You can use an in, independent proxy uh, to approximate it. Now we uh, talk applications to uh, mixture models. And we really want to show is that uh, spectral methods is not the second class citizen. It itself is the first class citizen. It itself is uh, uh, optimal, right? So again, uh, we begin with a simple example, right? So a mixture normal, 50% uh, from one class, positive sign, the other percent from negative sign, right? So, and now we, uh, so this is uh, what we model, model it, right? So the unknown sign of the population mean is randomly generated. And our goal is to recover uh, this mu. And our methods, just to remind us again, right? You've got the grand matrix, you set diagonal to zero. So this is a whole grand matrix. Now you've got the first eigenvectors, right? You use the first eigenvectors assigned to differentiate whether you are in class one or class two. Uh, and uh, so if we define uh, signal to noise ratio uh, like this, so this is the same as what we've seen before. Uh, so for Gaussian mixture uh, case, uh, we basically saying if signal to noise ratio is bigger than two plus epsilon uh, times log n. Uh, so in this case, you will, uh, you will get in the, I mean, full recovery, right? So the probability error equal to zero go to one. So, so there's no mistake being made uh, in this clustering. So you have uh, uh, full recovery. So if signal to noise ratio is bigger than one, but less than two log n, then uh, our estimation error would be, looks like, uh, like uh, like this. So our uh, uh, cl clustering error rates would be looks like this. And in particular, if you really just to put in uh, two plus epsilon here, if you to put two plus epsilon here, uh, then uh, it would be like the, the rate would be n to one plus half epsilon, right? So a little bit bigger than n. Now we know that the uh, we know that uh, when we do clustering, the minimum classification error will be in the in the units of one over n, right? So if you see you are an automatic less than that, uh, so it's really with, uh, right, I mean uh, reverse to the first case. So in, in other words, you can see a continuity between result one and two, and both results are minimax uh, uh, optimal. And this kind of optimality has only been shown by, uh, uh, by using SDP or using spectral method that you have to do fine uh, tuning. Uh, we basically showing here is the spectral math itself uh, is already uh, achieved uh, minimax uh, optimal. And uh, we can, I mean, show similar results, right, for uh, sac Gaussian uh, errors. And this for sac Gaussian errors are uh, continue to hold. And here's really an interesting phenomenon that we uh, we uh, we see here, right? So we know uh, from Kai and John uh, uh, and John's paper that uh, uh, in order to have consistent clustering, right? Uh, so the the sig minimum signal uh, had to be uh, this large, and the special clustering will actually achieve this. Uh, so for consistency of estimating the parameter mu, right? So the principal component direction. Uh, mu, uh, the signal had to be bigger than that and order magnitude uh, too uh, big, right? So in other words, uh, we can see from here that uh, uh, PC score can be consistently in clustering, uh, even though the principal component direction uh, is not consistently uh, estimated. Now here is a generalization, as I said a moment ago, the result can be generalized to heteroscedastic sub-Gaussian mixtures, right, and multi-class uh, sub-Gaussian mixtures. So this is our model. I assume that you see you have n population mean, right, so uh, at a k class of population mean index, let's say, by one, two, three, four, five, right, so that, uh, and then this is in d dimensions. Uh, this mu k is the class center, right? Uh, uh, and then y i is just the label indicating which class uh, the data is. And we assume z i is heteroscedastic uh, with uh, the uh, covariance matrix uh, uh, 
I mean, controlled by this uh, sigma, right? So, uh, and uh, we really want to recover uh, the class label uh, from our observed data in D dimension. Right? So here is the spectral method that popularly applied. Um, so, uh, so again, we get in the uh, the hollowed gram matrix, right? And then we do spectral embedding. So we get uh, uh, we get the first k uh, principal components uh, directions. Right? So this is uh, uh, first k principal component directions, and then is associated the first top k empirical eigenvalues. Right? Uh, and now I just run uh, I mean k-mean algorithm based on uh, this uh, PC scores. Right? So I run k-mean algorithm. Uh, to further classify uh, PC scores. And uh, of course, this uh, everything here uh, is based on inner product. So you can extend the, the study to uh, kernel clustering uh, for reproducing uh, kernel Hilbert space. So, uh, so here is the, uh, the result we have. Right? So first, I need to assume some kind of regularity condition, which basically saying that the K cluster is approximately even sized, right? Uh, the, all those directions, the each cluster center, right, shouldn't be highly correlated. So they're more precise uh, pre prescription than that, right? And then we define signal to noise ratio. This is the classical part of uh, definition. Uh, plus we uh, add in uh, the correlation in high dimension, uh, adding uh, forbiddenness norm into uh, this uh, definition. Uh, so if these, uh, I mean, then we have these results, right? So if signal to noise ratio is in a strong region, uh, classification error be equal to zero, right? So uh, if uh, the uh, the error, I mean, is signal to noise uh, is in this region, then the classification error, uh, in this case, C is not like two plus epsilon, we can uh, exactly uh, pin down. We only know there exists such a, uh, a constant C, right? And then this would be like C uh, of that. And both of these are minimax uh, uh, optimal. And again, that the optimality has only been seen for SDP uh, and, uh, uh, and we really shown that special method itself can attain this. And if you compare our result with the classical one, when we both coincide, uh, our, our I mean, condition on signal to noise ratio in classical measure of SNR indeed is uh, uh, weaker than those uh, in the literature. And uh, no, there's a lot of, I mean, uh, studies in this, right? Including like K-mean algorithms, uh, SDP methods, spectral method, uh, Hilbert space method, and L-infinite control, and so on. There's a lot of way more literature than I can uh, say here that way of you uh, have made contribution on this aspect. So now let me uh, go to the, my last part of uh, study is on contextual uh, community detection. And again, we want to say is a very simple algorithm uh, that you can analyze, will be able to give you uh, a sharp guarantees, right? So what is uh, contextual community uh, detection? So this problem has been studied by many authors under different kind of uh, modeling assumptions. So basically we observe, uh, we observe a network Right, and each node has their attributes. Right, so in other words, we observe both the data, the attributes, uh, the covariates, like a Nietzsche model, and uh, also community uh, at the same time. So there are plenty of references that I'm uh, giving here, and uh, this is even not possible to cover uh, a variety of study in these areas. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, so what we uh, for we, what we do uh, for our study, the node feature I assume is uh, is Gaussian mixture model, the, the same picture that you see many times, right? So uh, like this, so with uh, positive one and negative one, right? so y is lot of variables, uh, z is Gaussian noise. So I observe node feature is give me already information how to cluster. Uh, two, commun uh, two, uh, two communities, right? And then I assume that in addition, you observe an adjacency matrix, which follows a stochastic block model, as we say a moment ago, within community is P, within community is P, between community connecting probably is Q. Right? So, this, so in other words, you observe uh, 
an adjacency matrix of m by n. And in addition, you observe n vectors, right? Uh, n vectors, uh, uh, each is from d dimensional vector. Um, and this d dimensional vector is generated from this Gaussian uh, mixture model. Uh, so this is the, uh, the toy example for us to understand the, uh, the, the, uh, the fundamental limits. Now, so in other words, given the community label Y, right? So we use this to generate uh, the, the node attributes whose mu would be either plus mu or minus mu, right? And the same given community, we use this to generate the adjacency matrix. So now, uh, now how do we combine these two pieces of information by using spectral methods? Right. So the first one, uh, based on node information, based on attributes of node information, uh, I have Gaussian mixture uh, data. So naturally, I would get in the hollowed uh, gram matrix, get the first eigenvector and the take sign. Right? So this is, uh, this is the method based on X. Right? The method based on A, as we said at the very early beginning in the introduction, you get the second eigenvector and then take the sign of that. Now the question is, how do we combine these linear or nonlinear, or in what way? Right? So, uh, so is uh, is a very simple aggregation. Right? So we have both eigenvectors, uh, one from uh, from uh, the uh, gram matrix, uh, the other is from adjacency matrix. Right. So now you just do weighted uh, average. Right. So this is related to the first eigenvalue of this G. This is related to first and second eigen uh, value of this matrix A. Okay, so this is our procedure, and it just takes sign. Right? Uh, so this is a, a very simple procedure, analyzable. Now you may naturally asking why, right? So and the the reason, as we seen before, uh, I mean the clustering actually uh, could be very close to. As we do hollow analysis, you may recall I call at beginning called uh, CV Fisher, right? So uh, using cross validation to learn the direction and then apply the Fisher direction to do cross, uh, discrimination. The same way, right? So here I can consider Gini aided, uh, I mean classifiers, right? So suppose that I this is the data I observe, and in addition, people tell me everybody else uh, class label except the label you want to learn is uh, is concealed from you, right? So then naturally the optimal uh, classifier is like a ratio, right? So how likely you got class label one uh, to the uh, comparing to how likely you got getting class label negative one, right? Now, because of given Y, X and A are independent. So we can easily uh, write this into the likelihood uh, the log likelihood part, right, into two components. Right? The component, the first component is Gini aided, uh, learning based on node information, based on G, right? The second one is Gini aided based on A, based on the, uh, the network information. This is based on node uh, uh, information. So with uh, these two, right, so now uh, the next step is, to right, I mean, compute these like ratios, right? So this guy uh, for network, we actually using L infinity uh, type of approximation in our paper year uh, 2000, probably in annals, right? So this part uh, is very similar to what we calculated before uh, based on that. So you can uh, show that, uh, that uh, the, yeah, right? So you have linearization, uh, uh, the like ratio is related to the first eigen uh, vectors, and uh, the this is related to the second eigen vector of this A. So you can show this, right? So this is the ith component that you are computing the ith guys. So you can you can do this. Right? So if you substitute in, uh, you naturally leads to uh, this kind of uh, classifier. Right? So just like what we did before, now I have mu g and mu a. So I have. Uh, Population eigen uh, sample, uh, sorry, uh, sample eigen vectors, right? So we would like to linearize it. So in order to linearize it, 
I need to do to appeal to LP because if signal to noise is not strong enough, I cannot expect entry wise approximation. So we have to appeal to the uh, IP uh, approximation. And here is the results uh, we get, right? So let's say, suppose that uh, uh, we are in the strong signal dense regions, right? Or oh, in the uh, dense regions. Uh, so this is within community uh, connection. The expected value is of log n order, a times log n order, right? Uh, of a number, I mean, uh, of connections. Uh, and then this is uh, between communities. And this is the signal to noise ratio. Everything I assume is in the log n regions. Then we can define uh, this IAB, which is control, I mean, is really aggregate the signal from uh, the network and from the uh, from the uh, the node information. Uh, we can show that uh, if IAB bigger than two, then you can fully recover uh, the community identity without making any uh, mistakes, right? So if uh, a is between zero and two, we now get in the error rate like this. So, so very similar is an extension to what we had before, right? And both of those are optimal. And of course the results encompasses both, uh, right? So if I take in Z, C equal to zero, this recovered the result that we had uh, for uh, stock app block models. Uh, if you take square root A equal to square root B, A equal to B, so you have no signal from uh, from the network, uh, so you get in the result we have before. So this is a, a generalization. And this can easily be verified in the simulation. So uh, in order to verify this, uh, uh, this, we do the simulation for different combinations of A and B. And now we just plot in the full discovery rates, right? So if 100%, I use white, uh, right? So this is, uh, this is what we get when C is equal to 0.5, relatively small. And this is the red is the boundary that uh, this guy equal to two, right? So this is the uh, red is the, is the boundary. So when C is relatively small, yeah, you require A and B to be relatively bigger the difference, right? Uh, between A and B. Now, when C is relatively bigger, so the node information provides more information in order to do consistent clustering, A and B's requirements more. So this is matching very well with our results here, basically saying that uh, this is the aggregation of both uh, network information and the community uh, information. And then the lastly, uh, we want to say is because our LP analysis and thanks to the referee's uh, question, we were able to, uh, I mean, solve in a weaker sparser network, right? So uh, the question was whether we can apply our result to a sparser network in which uh, the, uh, here is not log n, but qn, qn is between log n, but, uh, but uh, go to infinity. So in this case, uh, I right, I weaken the signal to uh, to QM, and this is the same uh, in order for network uh, for sorry, for the node information not to dominate. So it also using the same QM, right? So we uh, I mean we apply the same procedure but slightly different analysis. So in this case, when Q network. Uh, Q is small, you have relatively sparse, right? So you have Bernoulli trial with a relatively number of trial, number of success, where you have very sparse uh, connected network. Uh, both lambda J and U, eigenvalue and eigenvector, do not concentrate uh, well. So in other words, you, I cannot apply empirical eigenvalue uh, value of these A's and so on. But fortunately, law large number still applies, right? So therefore the relative difference between A and B can be learned from something like this. So this is this kind of guy is really just apply law large number, just summation of AIJs, right? So they uh, give you uh, information about A plus B. Uh, and then if you apply the eigenvalue to this, it would give you information A minus B. So you can still learn some co consistently about A and B by using other tricks. And uh, with that, we can generalize our previous results to, uh, to a weaker case in which uh, this is not log n, so long as q n go to uh, infinity. And this is probably the most general bound, and this the bound is known to be uh, optimal. 
again, we are not the, uh, the, the I mean, the, the only player in this, right? so in both network have models, there are many different methods, started many different regions uh, and using different kinds of algorithms, right? And then you're using different kind of model uh, for studying a, a contextual uh, network. So there's a lot of other works uh, that should be mentioned here. I just give you uh, a sample of it. So let me uh, conclude, right? so it's exact, a little bit over an hour talk, uh, what, uh, what I have said so far. So first, uh, we, in order to show that uh, spectral clustering, spectral embedding is optimal, uh, we introduce an LP analysis of hollowed PCA. And this uh, enable us to linearize the eigenvectors, right? So the eigenvector is highly nonlinear, depending on original matrix. But once you do LP analysis, you are linearizing it. And the linearizing approximation error can only be controlled by using LP norm. And the, the stronger the P you got, uh, the better you have control. Let's say P big enough, big than log N, you have uh, approximately uniform uh, control. And then we apply this tool uh, to show that the special methods uh, uh, for clustering uh, indeed uh, I mean, is minimax optimal. And we verified this uh, using uh, Gaussian mixture models, right? So we're using uh, multi class uh, sub Gaussian mixture models. So this is a further generalization. But then the, uh, the identification of constant will not be as sharp as Gaussian mixture models. And then we apply this to, uh, I mean, uh, community, uh, uh, contextual community detections, uh, even allow the weaker signal uh, of, uh, let's say, sparse uh, network rather than dense uh, networks. And this kind of results uh, encompass both network and the mixture models. So this is all I want to uh, talk about uh, this paper and the, the paper certainly can be you know, found on the archive.org. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jenjin, for a fabulous talk. Um, so the floor is open for questions. Um, you can either um, raise your hand and I'll try and uh, spot you or type a question into the chat. Um, the Zoom chat is probably the easiest if, if you're on Zoom. So um, who's going to kick us off with a question? Well, Jansen, you obviously gave far, far too good an uh, explanation of everything and they, everyone understood everything. So uh, um, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll ask a question. Uh, wh where do you see this uh, methodology and theory going in the coming years? Uh, there's been obviously quite a lot of development in, in, in this direction over the last five, six years or mm -hmm. so. Um, do, do you think we're still missing areas, re results, or, or do you think that... Um, uh, we, we're starting to see a, a fairly complete picture. Yeah, so um, uh, they're actually very good and very challenging questions, right? So uh, certainly, uh, I mean, uh, we, uh, I mean, certainly they uh, still have a lot of questions on those spectral methods or more complicated methods um, uh, to get the, like a, a, a minimax, uh, uh, let's say sharp guarantees, right? So for example, for the contextual community detection, right? So uh, one paper can only do that much. We only do for two, let's say, uh, two classes, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, and then for Gaussian mixture, we get in, uh, uh, we get in more sharp categorization, even the constant is break at two uh, for let's say non, uh, uh, non uh, let's say Sargaussian, uh, 
uh, is less, right? So now a uh, spectral method applied to a broader class of problems, as we said before, like uh, uh, phase retrieval, blind deconvolution, uh, and so on. And many of those, uh, we always use these kind of methods just as a as an initialization. So I will hope to give proper credit to like a special methods mm. uh, that uh, there's uh, uh, so uh, so in other words if we can get, uh, show the uh, the optimality guarantee then right I mean many second step is probably not uh, uh, not necessary so in other words there's still a lot of work we haven't done it yet but the the idea of linearization or like an extra turn of eigenvector right being putting uh, eigenvector being putting as a linear combination uh, by replacing the other part by like population counterparts yeah so that provide a very useful tools uh, to many problems that involve uh, eigenvector, right? So we usually see, hey, when I analyze eigenvector, I got very nervous where to begin with, but after you replacing uh, part of it by population when you are already linearized and, and so yeah. so So I thought there's, uh, yeah, this is, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, a lot of thing in this area, I mean, um, spectral matter appear all over the place, right? So I assume, hope that people can, uh, analyze beyond Gaussian mixture model and uh, uh, community detection. You, you have uh, many um, model and tensor and so on. There's a lot of study can be done too. For further questions for Jenjen? Well, I don't see any uh, further clamoring for questions. Uh, so uh, in that case, so oh, oh there is one question, Richard. I'm just going to copy paste it uh, to the Zoom chat window. Just give me. Oh, a okay. Okay, shall I read out the question? This is a question from Rong Chen, who, who asks, how would you take into account the response Y in bedding of X in a regression setting? Um, okay, so uh, yeah, that's uh, in the regression setting, I assume is like, a, uh, I think you are probably thinking of more general, like uh, uh, Gaussian mixture models or something like that. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, for apparently, I mean, for, I mean, for more general Gaussian mixture models, I, yeah, or I mean, mix, uh, I mean, mixture, mix regression or mixture expert uh, type of models, right? So I haven't get quite the, a careful look how my why, the, I mean, the community labels, right, uh, can be written as a, uh, as a left eigenvector of uh, some, uh, I mean, matrix. So I haven't taken a look at that, but that's certainly an interesting question. Uh, you and I are not very far apart. Maybe one day we can sit together and think think about it. I assume you are thinking of more, like a more general uh, regression model. Is is an interesting question. Uh, another uh, question just appeared. Uh, yeah, nice. Glenn Sutton, would you see any way forward if there are more than two groups? Yeah, so uh, yeah, so we only resolve one province right, for more than two groups, right? So this that is when we have Gaussian mixture model with more than two groups uh, that we do uh, like a spectral embedding, right? So you you take the first. Uh, uh, let's say if you have K communities, you cho uh, choose uh, K groups, you choose uh, top K eigenvectors, and then you embed data on those top K uh, eigenvectors, and now you do k mean uh, clustering. Now, uh, if we have K classes 
of network together, right? So in other words, in our contextual community detection, I have key communities there too. Uh, so we haven't studied that. We on, uh, we were uh, we we will only do for one uh, special uh, case of uh, uh, one special case of uh, here, right? So uh, the yeah, so multi-class uh, multi-class case. We only do one particular case for Gaussian mixture. Uh, so even that for Gaussian case, we even have a very I mean, how to say they're very precisely characterized where is the separation boundary is. We do get, however, uh, the, uh, the, I mean, the rate of convergence like depend on signal to noise ratio, just like these C and little C, uh, I mean, uh, for Gaussian case, we didn't narrow those, uh, those uh, that we only deal for Gaussian. Now, if we have contextual uh, multi-class Gaussian, yeah, it's a good question. We haven't done that yet. As I said, we want we only work to this point because referee asking us to do it. So we we uh, we work uh, apply those mechanism and get it. But a good question. Thanks. Oh, did you see any more questions in the chat? No, Richard. No, no more yet. Okay. In that case, uh, let me thank Jenchen again for, for his great talk uh, and this uh, congratulate him also on this uh, wonderful honor. And thank you very much uh, to everyone for attending. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Jenchen. Thank you, thank Richard. You.